Okay, so uh, good morning. I'm Rob Gladwin from uh, BSF and I'm Head of Business Development and Sustainability. So maybe just a little bit of a, a potted history of the Metazaclaw Matters uh, stewardship campaign. It was a, a decision taken on a, on a European basis um, by BSF and Adama to come together to put effective stewardship around Metazaclaw and now subsequently Quimarac. Uh, to basically protect these active ingredients uh, for the horsey grape uh, agronomy and for horsey grape farmers while trying to minimise their, their movement to water and address the concerns that were being raised by, by water companies, not only in the UK but, but across Europe. The focus of the Metazaclaw Matters uh, activities was really to give agronomists and farmers practical advice on what they should be doing uh, around the agronomy of the crop uh, and then addressing the specific issues related to uh, Metazaclaw and, and Quimarac. So what we hope is that by and taking an agronomic approach to it that we're able to tackle many of the issues or risks that are associated with these products before we get into having to give a uh, dose or calendar date restrictions which is uh, what you'll see as part of the, the stewardship campaigns. So what I'll do now is talk a little bit more uh, about uh, all seed rate and maybe some background information which you guys uh, may find uh, useful. As you'd be aware, all seed rate remains uh, a very profitable uh, break crop, um, but as you'd be aware, investment, uh, input investment is under scrutiny. Um, and this is particularly waiting until the crop is, is established. And cabbage stem flea beetle, which has, has become a major problem due to the uh, loss of the neonic uh, seed treatments, growers are really looking at uh, justifying what they're doing agronomically and waiting in some cases until the crop is established before making uh, investment decisions related to herbicides. Issues also with slugs and the uh, phenomenon of, of pigeons in the UK um, but also crop economics also has a role uh, to play here. It's worth saying at this point that the winter oilseed rape area is around, we estimate based on Anderson's figures, which is a, a business consultancy business uh, who, that collates for the industry. We expect somewhere in the region of 580,000 hectares of winter oilseed rape to go in the ground uh, this autumn. If you compare that historically, last year it's probably in about that region, maybe 560, um, but certainly is nowhere near the peak of uh, maybe three or four years ago where it was 700,000. And many of that, much of that is due, or that decline is due to crop, crop economics, but also the issues related to cabbage stone flea pickle. So where growers are looking to uh, delay in their decision, they are moved to more post-emergence applications from what was the true pre-emergence so that's basically before the crop has emerged and with that and particularly where and this impacts particularly uh, uh, metazacor and quimarac because they have that flexibility of being used early uh, pre-emergence of the crop so before the crops established through to, um, up to up to three or four true leaves of the crop there is the potential risk of increase to surface water um, and therefore, due to the physical chemical properties of the active ingredients, which we'll talk about in a minute, but also as you move later into the season, the environmental and field conditions uh, combined with the calendar date potentially increase that risk. And so it's important that agronomists and growers understand the potential risks are to water, that, sorry, the potential increase in risk to water as we move later into the season. Okay, Alison, next slide. So this is just a diagram demonstrating the, the growth stages and basically what we're looking at is a lot of activity and a lot of investment going into the crop basically before it's got those three to four true leaves. <clears throat> and obviously you'll be aware of the challenges around uh, slug control, but we'll focus on for the purposes of today the, the uh, herbicide programs. And basically what we're looking to do, what the agronomist and farmer is looking to do is to take those broadleaf weeds out uh, at that very early growth stage. So as you can see, as the seed's gone into the ground, that would be the true pre-em timing. And as the crop emerges, you get the cotyledons, um, uh, which are displayed there up to, up to three uh, true leaves. And you're looking to basically take care of those broadleaf weeds in that, uh, in that calendar uh, or in that growth stage window. 
and metazochloroquine Mirac are perfectly suited uh, to that uh, particular application. And you'll see also that you then talk to, starting to talk about volunteer control, also from a serial perspective, but also then if you look further right, you've got the, the, the black grass. And although metazochlor and Quimarac are a good base to that program, there is still a need to be applying uh, products slightly later in the season to tackle those particular uh, grass weeds. And they will be based on the propizamide uh, and carbetamide uh, based chemistry. So for the purposes of the metazochlor and Quimarac, it's really about taking care of those broadleaf weeds. There's many listed there, but certainly chickweed, uh, mayweed, charlock um, are, are particular challenges and need to be taken care of early in the growth stage of the crop to avoid, uh, to avoid crop competition. Uh, next slide, Alison. Um, and this work from, from NIAB TAG um, illustrates nicely why actually this early application is, is important. In the early 90s and mid 90s, NIAB TAG, an independent research organization, did a number of trials with, in all seed rate with broadleaf weeds and looked at the average yield response from, from application uh, made at that early timing. And as you can see, the average yield response was very interesting at 0.6. Four tons a hectare, so just over 0.6 of a ton per hectare. So you're getting a good yield response from those earlier applications. However, what's happened of, of late with the advent of hybrid technology coming into seed breeding um, and probably seed rates being reduced because you have more competitive uh, crops um, and they're better able to establish. ADAS have done further work um, looking at this in the 21st century situation. And as you can see, the broadleaf the effects of yield responses now are considerably higher because of these lower seed rates. You have less initial crop competition at that earlier growth stage and the, the, the crop is actually, a, and can in some cases, be really affected by broadleaf weeds. And obviously you can see their yield responses now up to two tonne per hectare where you're not taking care of that. So the case agronomically of taking, con taking uh, control of those weeds um, is, is important and where we are moving later into the growth stage of the crop there's more risk and certain key weeds are not taken uh, care of and obviously if you go later the risk of being unable being unable to travel uh, with equipment is also increased so by choosing uh, the pre-M or this very early post-M, it removes that worry either as a solo, so on its own as a one-shot treatment, or as part of a program which may include increasingly aminopyrrolid and propizamide uh, in, a, in a program type approach. Okay, next slide, Alison. And what we did here is, and this is taken from the AHDB All Seed Rate Guide, and this actually is a very useful source of information around all seed rate growing. Um, and I would recommend that if you've if you've not got a copy of it, to to obtain a copy of it. It's available on the AHDB website as a as a PDF download. And this chart basically demonstrates uh, illustrates uh, many of the points that I've been making about the products. And particularly, and I'll, I'll draw your attention to the metazochlor and metazochlor quimarac uh, products, which have that pre to early post emergence uh, timing. So there are a number of broadleaf weeds available. I've already talked about Sherlock. Another important one is cleavers, um, because that actually not only competes with the crop early, but also can, it's basically with, it stays with the crop throughout its life and actually causes potentially harvesting problems as it grows up uh, with the canopy and the, the, the cleavers use the canopy structure to grow up there. Mm. Crane's bill is also an important part and many of you will um, see poppies um, and that's often a testament to what a active, ingredient, sorry, active ingredients have gone on to that crop, particularly in May and June when you see that red hue across much of the countryside. And as you can see, metazochlor and metazochlor quimarac based products offer a pretty broad range uh, of, of broadly weed control and are really essential in that, in that um, pre to early post-emergence timing. There are later post-emergence treatments available and we did get a question uh, prior to the webinar related to 
substitutability of products and one which maybe comes into the frame is, is a product like uh, carbetamide or propizamide. And actually these are complementary to metazochlor and quimerac because of their weed spectrum and they tend to be focused more on uh, uh, the grass weed control, they offer some broadleaf weed control, as you can see, so propizamide, they're offering control of, 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 of chickweed, but overall their, their weed control from a broadleaf weed perspective is limited. And if you go to the next slide, Alison, this, this illustrates that point very nicely, and this is looking at the grass weed control, and winter oilseed rape is a key crop for control of black grass, and using alternative modes of action. So again, I draw your attention to the propizamide and carbetamide um, susceptibilities. And as you can see, they offer a broad range of, of, of grass weed control versus something like metazoclor and quimerac, which basically offers some annual metagrass control, a useful start to black grass, but by no means complete control. And so you're relying much more on those propizamide, carbetamide products to, to give you control of black grass. It's using alternative modes of action in the crop. And if you look further right on the chart there, you'll see what we call the FOP and DIM herbicides. So those offering uh, contact activity against such things as black grass. And you'll see, although it says, um, historically they would have been susceptible, but there is increasing level of resistance to those particular products. And so although they are used in some cases for volunteer control of cereals, particularly uh, barley or, or wheat, they can't be relied on from a black grass control perspective. So hopefully that gives you a flavour of the, the type of programmes that are, uh, are being uh, constructed uh, to give control of not only broadleaf weeds, but also grass weed uh, control. Okay, next slide, Alison. So one of the things that we've been talking about and getting agronomists and growers to, to really give some serious consideration to is the state of the soil and also the seed bed uh, preparation. And really what we're looking to do is all seed rape is a very small seed and this needs to have good seed to soil contact um, and this needs to be considered when you're when you're drilling um, not only is that good in terms of uh, all seed rape herbicide stewardship but from a basic agronomy perspective what usually is good for the seed will be good for all seed rape herbicide stewardship so getting a good uh, fine uh, tilth and a good uh, crumb structure with good aggregation through um, the soil profile basically gets that good soil seed contact. You are the crop is able to re to emerge very rapidly, which basically means that it's better able to cope with the ravages of, of slugs and the cabbage stem flea beetle, but also that the crop is also uh, can have the application of, of all seed ray herbicides, so the metazochlor quimerac based products, and basically then can move rapidly through its growth rates to establish to also outcompete um, the, the, the broadleaf weeds that may still be there. It also means that you retain surface moisture, um, at, or you retain, mo retain moisture at the, at, the, at the soil surface, again, getting good uh, germination and you get good soil structure at depth and that's particularly important when we're talking about uh, movement to uh, surface water which is the main challenge with metazochlor and quimerac in the fact that you don't have these big uh, cracks running through the soil uh, profile which in some cases are super highways for the product to move to drains and actually um, is, a, is a challenge uh, to basically keep the herbicide where it needs uh, to do that. So very clear messages around soil and actually tackling the problem before we get into what is the calendar date uh, restrictions. And there's further work being done on this. And again, HDB is a good source of information if, if you want further, further information and background to that and, and particularly related to soil management. Okay, Alison. So as I've, uh, this illustrates this very nicely in the seedbed on the, on the right there, um, is a perfect example of it. Um, it's a good, it's a, it's a good, well-structured seedbed. We've got good uh, trash. Um, they've gone for a, a min till uh, type establishment, um, and we get a good fine till. Now we do, we are aware that on some soil types, this is difficult to achieve. 
However, where growers are focusing more on soil management and looking particularly at organic matter content and the overall management of their soils, we are moving, we feel, in the right direction um, on those soils to, to move towards this kind of achievable seed bed. Um, and so the message here is what is good for the seed is usually good for residual herbicides and the tazachloroquine marac would fall into that category and is good for uh, overall stewardship of, the, of these products. Okay, let's see the next slide. So just a little bit of background to metazochlor and quimbarac. Um, as I've already talked about, they remain essential components of the early, herbis early season herbicide programs. The chemistry particularly related, they have a very similar profile from a chemistry perspective and the solubility and mobility in water are either uh, rated as high or, or, or medium. So that in, by its very nature, uh, demonstrates that we need to take uh, the stewardship of these products um, seriously because there is the potential for them to move around um, and they are, are relatively soluble. But one thing which plays into their favor, and this is why we're looking to try and keep applications early season, is their persistence in soil. And their, relative, their, le their level of persistence is relatively low. So actually getting the product on in good time allows the products uh, to do their job, which is what they're designed to do, to take the weeds out, allows the crop to establish, but more importantly, for them to rapidly break down um, and then not be a problem later in the season, particularly when we start getting into more uh, heavy rainfall events, which is very typical of, of, of as we move later into the calendar uh, season. So those, those sort of three or those two key aspects um, may lend itself to basically the message of getting the product on, on early in the growth stage. So Alison, if you take the next slide. So Alice, I'll hand over to Alison now and she'll talk to you a little bit more about this, how these products potentially can get into water. Okay, thanks Rob. So firstly, how can metazoclon quimarac get into water? Um, and in fact, we're not just talking about metazoclon quimarac. This is all pesticides potentially. And um, broadly speaking, that the, there are two different routes. Um, firstly, there's the farmyard sources, which are also sometimes called point sources. Um, and these are the roots that are, that are related to um, the filling of application equipment, the cleaning of application equipment, the waste management, really all the activities that happen before or after spraying. Um, now, these sources can be avoided. Um, and in fact, as I said, these are not unique to metazoclor and crimerac. They, um, there is a potential risk for all pesticides. So, as part of the metazoclor matter stewardship, we don't address these directly. Uh, they're very well addressed via the voluntary initiative. So any more information about point source um, contamination, we'll definitely direct you to the voluntary initiative website for more information. Now, in terms of field sources, this is the other route. Um, field sources um, really relates to application of the pesticides to the crop. Um, so, and, and the potential routes for contamination of water following this application. So it could be via spray drift, it could be via field drainage, surface runoff or leaching. Now these are a potential risk and as, as Rob just talked about, because of the timing of the application of Betazacor and Quimera and also their properties, um, that there is a, a potential risk for these two actives to get into water. So what we're trying to do with the stewardship is to minimise this. Um, and as we'll talk about more as we go through the webinar, field drainage and um, understanding whether you're farming on drained land is absolutely key to this. So what is, what's the scale of the problem for metazoclor and quimerac? Um, if you look at the graph on the left hand side here, this is just an, one example um, of some detections of these herbicides in water. Um, and in this case, it's the River Lem. Um, and you can see there that there are peaks, um, spikes of the herbicides. And it's not just um, metazoclor and quimerac. You can see some of the other herbicides that Rob's been talking about that play a really important role as part of a all seed rape herbicide program, for example, carbetamide, propizamide, and chlorpyrrolid. So we see spikes of these herbicides 
mainly related to their use in oil seed rape. Um, the dash line towards the bottom is the drinking water limit. So this is what um, the water companies need to achieve at TAP. Now, what these spikes do, um, the water companies, all, all of these herbicides can be removed from water with water treatment. Some are harder to remove than others. So, for example, Quimerac is harder to remove than, than metazoclor, but they can be removed. But where we have these really high spikes, it can lead to saturation of the, that water treatment process and cause real headaches, real problems for the water companies in meeting that drinking water directive limit of 0.1. So what we're trying to do with the stewardship is really reduce the intensity of those spikes um, so that there isn't such an issue in terms of water treatment and saturation of the processes there, and also decrease the frequency. Um, so this, that's what we're trying to do with the stewardship. And again, look, looking at the scale of the problem, um, the Water Framework Directive in the UK uh, controls the, is a legislative framework to control the, uh, the quality of inland water in the UK. And as part of the Water Framework Directive, we can define these safeguard zones. And these are areas that are of a particular risk um, of contamination of surface water, particularly surface water that, that's taken for, for use as drinking water. Now, within, the, within England, there are 125 uh, designated safeguard zones. And to, to put this into context, um, 96 of those are designated because of the potential risk due to pesticides. But if we look at metazoclor and quimerac, quimerac is a reason um, in nine of those safeguard zones and metazoclor in seven of those safeguard zones. So certainly these two active substances are on the radar of the water company. We need to, water companies, um, we need, and there is a risk of non-compliance. So we certainly do need to take these very seriously and manage that risk. But the scale of the problem is not as large as some other um, pesticides. And I think metaldehyde is the one that um, many people are aware of in this context. And then th this slide here shows where those safeguard zones are. Um, and you can see for both metazoclor and quimerac, they're mainly concentrated around the centre of England, which is where um, all seed rape is, is grown, which is what we'd expect. But I think the important point here is we need to be especially careful in safeguard zones, but actually there's a potential risk on all drained land. Um, so the stewardship applies throughout the UK. So what are we proposing as part of the metazoclor matters stewardship um, in order to manage this risk? Um, well, I think the agronomy is very important, as Rob's already talked about, making sure the soil's right, that the herbicides are put on in a, in a relevant and appropriate manner to do the job they need to do. Then above and beyond that, what we've been promoting for the past few years are specific um, guidelines when using metazoclor and also quimerac. Now, the first layer of this is looking at the maximum dose. So for metazoclor, we're saying the maximum dose should be no more than 750 grams AOI per hectare. And for quimerac, it's 250 um, grams AOI per hectare. And in fact, all the current products in the UK will deliver these maximum doses. So if you like, that job's already been done. Follow the label and you'll follow the maximum dose. So the first question really a farmer grower has to ask um, his or herself is around whether they're farming on drained land. Um, and if we go down the right hand side of the flow chart here, if actually if you're not farming on drained land, we would say the risk is relatively low. So there are no specific timing restrictions with respect to, um, to water protection uh, beyond the label if you're not farming on drained land. If you are farming on drained land, so we're going down the left hand side here, the next question you need to ask is, are you in a safeguard zone? Because if you are, we're saying that there should be an absolute cut off of the 1st of October for application of any metazoclor or quimerac. That's because the risk of contamination of water increases um, after this date. If you're not in a safeguard zone, we're saying there can be some flexibility. Um, the farmer, the agronomist, they understand their land better than anybody. So if the conditions are good, if you've got a good seed bed, if the drains aren't flowing, then 
you can still apply Matazic Law and Queen Merit up to around about the middle of October, so the 15th of October, um, safely. So those are the, the guidelines that we're promoting through Matazic Law Matters stewardship. Now, where can you get more information? Well, we've produced um, a leaflet which summarizes the guidelines and the key actions, um, and that's available. So if anyone would like any copies of those, just get in touch with myself or Rob and we can provide those. Um, the other thing we can do is provide spokespeople for any events if you'd like anyone to talk about stewardship, particularly Matazic Law and Quimerac. Um, there's also information on the VI website about the Matazic Law Matters stewardship and in fact stewardship to, related to um, many other pesticides as well, so that's a great resource. The other, um, the other thing I wanted to mention here is um, the Crop Protection Association, that is the industry body of the crop protection industry, um, because the, the, the CPA has initiated a stewardship um, approach for all of the old seed grape herbicides. Um, because as you'll recall from a couple of slides previously, when we're talking about these potential spikes, it's not actually just metazic or quinerac. Some of the other oils, important in all seed rape herbicides, such as carbetamide, propizamide, and chlorpyrrolid, are also potentially, um, it could also potentially cause a problem. So that scheme has been launched, um, that is ongoing, and we should hear more about that over the next few years. So these are, those are the resources that are available, um, and I'll hand back to Rob just to summarise what we've been talking about today. Okay, thanks, Ali. So um, to summarise um, what we've uh, discussed throughout the throughout the presentation, as you as already highlighted, there is a trend from uh, pre-em uh, prior to the crop emerging through to early post-emergence uh, applications for metazachlor and quimerac based products. Um, which and th this trend is there because of the agronomic challenges that growers are facing and growers wanting to delay investment in weed control until they're sure they've got a crop. This has the potential to increase the risk of movement to water and agronomists and growers need to be aware of that. However, what we are seeing at the moment, although we are seeing this shift to early post-emergence applications, so before three true leaves of the crop, actually it can still stay with, within the stewardship guidelines. And what helps in that is getting the agronomy right. And if you get the seed bed and the soil preparation uh, correct, the stewardship guidelines will follow. And it allows Metazacor and Quimerac to be applied early, ideally by the 1st of October, um, on drained land, and it can do its job it breaks down and then isn't a problem uh, and there isn't a risk of movement to water later in the season. Okay, so Alison, back to you in terms of general questions. Okay, thank you, Rob. So I think just as we're waiting for any questions to come through, and just a reminder that, that any questions can come in via the Q&A button at the top of the screen there. We're more than happy to take them now or um, after the webinar. We're gonna run a quick poll um, so if that's going to pop onto your screen very soon, and if you could answer that. Okay, so maybe while we're doing that, one question we a question which uh, we had prior again to the to the webinar was related to the the use of these active ingredients on other crops, and um, basically Quimerac and metazacor based products primarily. Um, the vast majority of product is applied to winter raw seed rape, as we've talked about. There is a small use of, of some metazacor based products in um, vegetable crops, um, brassicas for example, but this really is a, is a, is a minor uh, part of it and, and we would probably suggest that that's probably not in, in what we would term the high risk areas, um, which you highlighted in the, in the uh, graphics earlier on related to uh, risk um, in safeguard zones. So um, the real focus of the, the campaign is, is quite rightly on, on winter or seed rate. Okay, thank you very much. Ah, uh, there we are, we've got the poll results now. And actually, I'm, I'm feeling pretty happy because um, oh, we've got 100% um, 
the, the question was, how well do you understand the metazoclore matter stewardship guidelines? I've got 100% very well, and I feel confident um, in explaining them. So that, that's great news. Um, but if there are any more questions, um, I'm here to answer them, and so is Rob. So let me just have a, a look. Okay, we don't, I think, have any questions on the line now, but so if there's anything that um, you think of after the webinar, do get in touch and we'll do our best to answer those. So thank you very much for joining us this morning and um, hope everybody has a great day. Thank you. Thank you.